Hey everyone, and welcome back to Civics Review. Today we're going to be talking about forms of government. Not going to lie, guys, this is a tough one. Well, let's get to it. All around the world, in any country you visit, you're going to find one thing in common, and that's someone is in charge. It doesn't always look the same, though, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the way in which a country is controlled is actually known as the form of government, and this includes the decision-making of the country and the choice of ruler. Now, stop doodling on your paper and add this to your civics notes. Now that we understand that a form of government is the way in which a government is controlled, who has the power and control in America? What's our form of government? I'll give you a second to think about it while I set up the forms of government chart that we're going to be adding to the notes. All right, did you think about it? Well, I guess first we should look at the chart. Now, when we go to another country and we think about the form of government and who's in charge, there can be a couple of answers. None, nobody, one person's in charge, some or a few, or all. Everyone's in charge here. Now, when you're thinking about the United States, you were probably leaning towards this position as the form of government in this country. We must be in the category of one person in charge. That's our form of government. That's really good thinking, but that's actually wrong. In the United States, everyone has decision-making power in this country, and we exercise that power by voting. That's right, we vote for the president. It might not seem like the people have power, but without our vote, they don't get into office. And we call this form of government, when everyone has control of the government, as democracy. And this is one of the most popular forms of government in the world. Let's formally define this in our notes as decision-making of the country belongs to the people. And the people exercise that by voting. Think of voting as a steering wheel. The people can control and steer the government with their vote. Now, there are two kinds of democracies that you need to know for this test. One is direct democracy, and the other is representative democracy. Let's go over direct democracy first. And this form of government is all in the name. We vote for things directly. Education, healthcare, who we trade with, the environment, even laws. That will all be up to the people in a direct democracy. Direct democracies work very well in smaller countries. You probably have direct democracy in your classroom. If there's some kind of issue that you guys are all deciding on, Everybody has a vote, you vote directly on the issue, and then the majority wins. This does not work super well in a larger country. Let's say your classroom had 9,000 students in it and you wanted to do a vote. It could take an entire class period just to gather the votes, probably more. And what if there were multiple issues in which you needed to vote on? Like six things you wanted to vote on, and tomorrow you had 10 things you wanted to vote on. You can see that direct democracies involve a lot of citizen participation, and that's why we don't have this in the United States. Okay, let's examine representative democracies to note the differences. In this form of government, everyone has power, but we're not voting on every single public issue directly. Instead, we're going to vote for a representative. This is a person that focuses solely on making decisions about public issues for the people they represent, for the people that voted for them. This works really well in countries that have larger populations or larger geographic areas. Rather than voting on a thousand different issues every day, the people of America are going to choose one person to represent them, and those elected officials will get to make Make all the decisions for the people. The downside to this is you have to trust the representative you elect, and that can be really tough to do. If you choose somebody to make all the decisions for you, and that person elects to have pineapple pizza tomorrow, well, you gotta eat pineapple pizza. You gave them the decision-making power, and now you gotta live with it. Maybe the best way to visualize the difference between direct and representative democracies is by thinking about the ballots. If you are voting for a person, that is a representative. If you are voting for a public issue, then that's direct democracy. We're voting on every individual thing. Okay, enough about that. Let's talk about the form of government where only a few people are in control, and we call this an oligarchy. The simplest definition for this form of government is just rule by a few. Imagine a small group of people ruling over and making all the government decisions for a large population. Now this small group of people that's in charge of everything, usually they share something in common. And that could be that they're the richest people in the country, or that they're the most educated or intelligent. It could be that they're involved with the military, or even that they all belong to the same religious faith. Whatever it may be, this small group gets to make the law, and make all the decisions on public issues. There is this cool kids club mentality where 
where only a few can rule over everyone, and if you're not in the club, there's really no way to get in. Which means in oligarchies, there is no voting. And if a country has voting, and you cannot see my air quotes that I'm doing right now, but if they have voting, it's usually some form of fixed election. Now there's going to be some countries we can go to where not everyone is in charge and not that group of cool kids is in charge, but one person. We can point to that one person and say they make all the decisions, you go complain to them. And these can be monarchies, dictatorships, or autocracies. And we'll start with monarchies first, and there's two types. Absolute monarchies and constitutional monarchies. And of course when we say monarch, we mean a king. You knew that, right? Let's start with absolute monarchs first. In this form of government, we have laws, and the laws must be followed by the people, or should I say peasants. However, the king in an absolute monarchy is above the law. This makes him absolute, right? He has unlimited power. This makes it super fun to be the king and super unfun to be anyone else in the country. Monarchs are not elected by the people, and they're not in a cool kid's club. They get their powers at birth, which is known as hereditary power because their mother and father is the king and queen. While this was a very popular form of government back in the day, it no longer is the case. A lot of people don't like living in a system where their ruler is above the law. And nowadays, most forms of government that include a monarch are actually constitutional monarchies. And as you might have guessed, a constitutional monarch has to follow the laws or the constitution of the land. And this severely limits their power, right? If a king has to follow the same rules as you and I, what really makes them the king? And so most constitutional monarchs nowadays are more like ceremonial leaders of the country. But somebody's got to be there to wear the crown jewels and invite other world leaders into the castle. Let's move on to another form of government that has one person in charge of everything, and that's called a dictatorship. To be a dictator, you are not born into power, you rise to power through use of the military. And everybody has to follow your orders and pretend to like you, otherwise you'll kill them. The countries that have dictators generally have very few guaranteed rights. And the last form of government that has one single ruler over everyone else is known as an autocracy. And an autocracy is a single ruler who has unlimited power. This could be like an absolute monarchy, it could be like a dictator, it could be an emperor, whatever, as long as this single ruler has absolute unlimited power. What we find in this case is even though some of these rulers might want to be benevolent or help their people, all of this power usually goes to the head and they abuse that power. And it's finally time to examine the last form of government, and that's when no one's in control. Now I want you to really think about this. What would society look like with no one in control? Not one person, not some people, not everybody. No one. This is always an interesting exercise because when we think about what government gives us, whether there's one person in charge or everyone's in charge, Government gives us laws and order, police forces, roads and infrastructure, militaries, jobs, businesses, government currency. And what would it look like if we didn't have those things because there was no form of government? Without government, we really have no community or no sense of community. And that can be a very scary place to live. This form of government is called anarchy and it doesn't last long because eventually somebody is going to take power, whether that's one person, a group of people, or everybody. Are you in charge here? Yes, I nope. am. Wrong. Ma I'm in charge. Is Me. Major Ben charge? Okay, I really wish we could wrap up the video right here and say that's it, that's all the forms of government. But unfortunately, this is not just about who is in control of a country, it's also about the ideas of running a country, and usually that has to do with the economy and property. The two ideologies we are required to know for the state test are socialism and communism. Socialism is an idea where the government controls the means of production. I know that's confusing. Let's start at the top. In a country that has socialism, the government controls the businesses that produce goods. Now you're probably wondering, what's the point? Why have the government control things like making phones or shoes? The main reason is to balance the wealth of the country so that we don't have large differences in the wealthiest people and the poorest people. All right, let's take a closer look at this so we can better understand it using an example. The company Nike makes $30 billion or more per year and they have an owner. Now that owner makes the majority of that money, 
but the thousands of employees that put the shoes together and ship them make significantly less money. However, a country with socialism would have the government run Nike, and they would design the shoes and set the means of production and even the price. The government would then distribute that wealth to the citizens fairly or equally. Economic equality is a great goal, but there's going to be some positives and negatives to socialism. The positives are there's going to be a more balance of wealth in the country. The negatives are pretty severe. There's less incentive to work hard or start or create a business. Why start a company like Nike? You're not going to be making a lot of money. You're going to make the same amount of money as the workers that work for you. Another negative to this ideology of socialism is that the government doesn't always make the best choices. Like what would government Nikes look like and would anybody want to buy them? Now please understand with socialism, it's not all or nothing. Some countries choose to have more socialism and other countries choose to have less. If you are in the USA and you are watching this video, chances are you're from public education. Your teacher has assigned you this video and public education is free because it's run by the government in the USA. That's not to say that every business in America is social, but we do have some social programs. Other countries might have more. And finally, we have communism where the government not only controls the means of production, but it also controls everyone's property. I like to think of socialism as ironing and communism as extreme ironing. I mean, it just takes everything socialism does to the max. So what does it mean when the government owns your property? Well, look no further than the communist symbol of the sickle and hammer. This symbol represents the working class. You know, the ones not making millions and millions of dollars, the ones making the wealthy business owners rich. And along comes communist governments like the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. And they tell the laborers, if we rise to power, if we take over the government, then everybody will have the same. You'll never go hungry. You're gonna have a house and a car and food and clothes and everything will be provided by the government. That sounds really appealing to somebody that has very little. The problem comes down to, can you trust those in power to make sure everybody gets the same? What we see historically is that the leaders of these governments oftentimes keep the wealth for themselves and share very little of it with the people. And there you have it, all the forms of government, all the ideologies of how you can run your government, all in one chart. But you're probably wondering, how am I going to remember all this stuff for the test, man? Just remember, someone is in charge. Ask yourself, how many people actually have the decision-making power here? If this is you and you're feeling totally overwhelmed right now or you were spacing out during the video, the number one thing to remember is what the United States has. Our form of government is a representative democracy. Everyone has power in America and we exercise that power by voting for representatives to make decisions in government for us. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks so much for sticking to the end of my video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. We'll make more videos soon.